Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Service uh, Planning and Policy uh, Council meeting. I'd like to first of all, uh, thank you. I'm Albert Richardson, the acting chair, and to introduce our vice chair, uh, Ms. Ricky Harris. Ricky, are you on the line? I am here, Albert. I'm just having problems with my video, but good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. We'll start with the approvals of the minutes uh, from the last state uh, statewide meeting held on June the 8th. I need a motion to approve. Debbie Hillen, motion to this approve. Is... Paul Futchkar, second. All in favor? All opposed? Any that abstain? By hands and, and looks, we look like it's approved. Has a curb has a commissioner got on yet? I don't believe so. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the commissioner will be on with us in a moment. Uh, so we can expect her probably in the next, uh, within the next five, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Just a few things to do, just a few. Um, Reminders, we're continuing to meet virtually um, per the Open Meetings Act just to keep everyone safe right now, especially with this new variant going around. Um, so with that being said, the meeting is being recorded and it will be posted to the department website within the next day or two. So please uh, remember to mute your phones, your computers. If you're not speaking, just to prevent any feedback and to make sure you introduce yourself uh, when you're asking any questions, it's helpful in capturing the minutes. Um, and if you've joined via phone, I see quite a few individuals who have joined via phone. If you don't mind to email me with your name so I can get you for attendance, um, it's at Kirby, K I R B Y dot Fi, F Y E, at TN.gov. Thank you. Thank you. I see the commissioner has joined us, us at this time. And so I'll move forth with uh, introducing the commissioner. I, in my belief, one of the hardest working, uh, most impactful commissioners in state government, our own Commissioner Marie Williams. Well, hey there, Mr. Albert Richardson. <laughs> hey, Commissioner, how are you? I'm good, sir. Thank you so much for your shout out. Uh, I am uh, hard working today in Chattanooga uh, at one of our state hospitals, Moccasin Bend Mental Health Institute. And I just saw Gail do a thumbs up. Uh, Gail, I'm in your town, sweetie. I've been here since uh, Sunday evening. Um, so doing a lot here. I'd like to scroll and just see who's all here, Albert, before I begin my comments. Senator Massey, it sure is good to see you. Always good to be here with thank, you. Thank you, dear. We're always glad to have you. Always glad to have you. Awesome. I see the teams on here. We've got a lot of people. This is great. I see all the community uh, providers as well. Very good to see you guys. Um, I'd like to start out. Um, I also saw that Laura Berland uh, is on here. Laura, uh, we're going to miss you. Um, a lot. Uh, your leadership and guidance has been amazing. I uh, want to thank you for all you've done uh, throughout the years to really move forward the effort related to mental health and substance addiction and uh, the way in which you did it, uh, which was fair and factual. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to her. Uh, Laura, do you want to make any comments uh, to the group? Well, I would say for better or for worse, you're not rid of me yet. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm moving my center of gravity to uh, Washington, D.C. to take over the International Adaptive Leadership Network that was launched out of Harvard a couple of years ago. 
but you are not rid of me yet. I'm going to keep some of my applications here in Tennessee and will continue to be as supportive as I can from that role uh, to you in this work because it's really important to me and have been a big part of my life for the last 10 years. So thank you. Laura, we're glad we're not rid of you yet. That's awesome. Um, we don't want to be rid of you at all. So uh, <laughs> that, that's good news to hear. Very, very good news to hear. All right. So um, on this beautiful sunny morning in Chattanooga, um, I'd like to update you guys on items that you actually have asked uh, for our department to update you on. Uh, and then obviously I'll open it up for questions and answers like I always do. Um, so the first one is uh, the update about the TDMHSAS 10 care work group on the workforce development issue. Uh, Senator Massey, I'm sure that you're very aware across all industries, we are having workforce shortages um, and it's truly impacting the social service field and the healthcare field. Uh, it appears disproportionately. Um, it is really being hard right now for our hospitals to hire individuals, uh, for our community providers to hire individuals. And to that end, we teamed up with TenCare. We wanted to do it jointly versus bifurcating and being siloed to come up with a plan that we will be presenting to the legislature and to the governor, uh, hoping that some of these ideas might could be enacted in the, in the coming uh, session. So uh, we have already met twice. Uh, we're having our third and final meeting, which is set for August 30th. Uh, at the final meeting, what we're gonna do is to discuss the edit and finalizing the work group's report on this issue. We will then publish that report. It will be on our uh, website as well as we will distribute it to all of those that are on our planning and policy council. And we will hold a separate meeting with the executive committee the planning policy council, Albert, will be asking you to sort of pull together some thoughts from that executive committee uh, to make sure that any addendum that we might want to add or include, we would do that. Uh, so that's important to know. The other thing that's very important, and, and again, um, I can't thank my team enough. Uh, Matt Yancey has been an incredible lead with this, as has uh, Mary Shelton from TenCare and then all the individuals that have supported Matt in this effort. Uh, what they decided to do, which I think is really wise, is to divide this up into short and long-term strategies. Uh, what are the things that we think we can accomplish quickly uh, with the support of the governor and the legislature? And then what are the things that we believe are gonna take longer term uh, that we'll, we will need the support of the legislature and the governor? I will tell you that we absolutely are including those strategies that the Planning and Policy Council have already brought forward to us. And those strategies will include reimbursement rates, internship opportunities, loan forgiveness, behavioral health, professional licensure issues related to supervisory hours. We're gonna be looking at this from every angle we can. Uh, and again, thank you guys for your feedback and, and information to us. Um, as I go through each of these updates, I'll stop at the end to make sure anybody that's got a comment or feedback. Um, and, and Senator Massey, I'd, I'd like to call on you. I know that it's impacting uh, the <coughs> developmental intellectual disability area as well. Anything you want to add on this subject before I open it up to all the planning policy council? I mean, I think you said it well. I mean, it's, I mean, I actually, you know, there's, in, employment issues in a lot of different fields, but I think it direct care workers and, and folks in our field and this field um, really are in, have impact, been impacted even before we had the pandemic. So uh, it's made it even more challenging and I think we've got to get more creative. Um, one thing that it's, a, it's It'll be kind of a side note, but uh, <clears throat> it's not, doesn't affect necessarily the staff we're talking about. But, you know, we did, I did pass my bill this past year on making state a model disability employer. And so that, that goes across all realms of people that are experiencing some type of disability. And so oftentimes the state has, uh, 
you know, said, okay, as providers, you, you find employment for the folks you're supporting, but we've not ever really walked the walk. And so this is going to set up a system to actively recruit and retain uh, individuals with disabilities as employees of the state government. So I'm really excited about that, that component going forward. Thank you, Senator. That, that's a great component. Thank you so much. Um, do we have the representative that's on our uh, planning and policy council on here, guys? I'd like to ask Avis. Avis, do we have um, our uh, representative from the House on here right now? No, Commissioner, I don't believe we do today. All right, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to the members of the council. Any feedback um, based on what I just went over? All right, hearing none, I will move on. Uh, the next area you guys wanted updates on are, are new grants, new programs, new opportunities. Uh, I can tell you the theme, and you can talk to our team <laughs> about being full steam in this year about uh, putting out $44 million worth of new state funding uh, uh, for grants out into the state uh, community. Uh, one of those is the Tennessee Resiliency Project, which really is focused on school age kids. That's an amount of $6.5 million, which is in addition uh, to the K through 12 trust fund uh, that was allocated last year. We just closed on the AOF for the FEPI expansion using the COVID-19 federal funding, which we're grateful for. Uh, and those really are the updates on that new funding. I, I'd open it up to any questions or comments on that. Okay, hearing none of that, I'll move on to the update on the 988 planning and implementation. Uh, I don't know if anyone is on here from TAMHO. Uh, but Ellen, if you're on here, um, I would love to uh, have you say a couple of words once we uh, get to that. Um, well, I see Ali Alicia, are you here? I'm here. Um, Ellen has a conflict. She's in another TAM meeting this morning. Awesome, awesome. So if you want to add anything to, to what I say, please feel free to do that. So as you guys know, we've partnered with TAM Ho and we're who's convening this work group for us, and we're facilitating this planning commission. Uh, we have had, uh, I think, two or three meetings uh, since it started, and we have very much highlighted and discussed what the legislation calls for, um, as well as looking at it in context. I think Senator Massey will be grateful to hear that Unlike many other states that right now are calling for tax increases uh, because of the 988 legislation, um, our state is going to take a uh, data uh, advised approach uh, because no one can predict how many calls we're going to get. No one can predict the COVID-19 impact. As y'all know, last year we saw a huge decrease in calls. We actually may see a decrease in calls. Um, so what we're going to do is go forward with the funding that we've already added to the crisis system and develop the plan that TAMHO uh, is leading for us. And we will monitor every month if we see any increase uh, and what that increase is both in the 988 National Suicide Hotline, as well as our crisis calls. If we see that it has gone extremely uh, in the upswing, uh, we will work with Tim Care. You guys know we don't solely fund the crisis system. It's funded through us and Tim Care. So we will work with them at that point to determine uh, the best way to move forward to ask for increases if they're needed. Um, we want to approach this fiscally sound uh, and utilize taxpayers' dollars in the best way possible. Again, we're in a great place in the state in that we already have a huge uh, infrastructure. Ben, I see you shaking your head. If you're talking or listening to the national group, you'll know 
the main thing is other states don't have our infrastructure. They don't have crisis stabilization units. They don't have mobile teams. They don't have 24 seven call. We've got all that. So for anybody that is hearing um, fear based comments or fear based rumors that somehow we're not going to get what we need. I am assuring you we have the complete infrastructure to do what we need and we're going to track it and we're going to base our request on data uh, so that we're not going to the legislature with some guess that's not based on anything. Uh, it will be based on data. Finally, uh, there's been rumors about, well, then people aren't going to get the calls answered. Nobody's going to get a call answered. Not true. Not true at all. If you read the legislation, it is incumbent upon the national suicide hotline to be staffed to answer any call state. Uh, so will be answered. We will not go without an answer rate. There's a great plan for that. Um, so at this moment, I would uh, open it up for any uh, comments or questions anyone has. I would just comment. Thank you for the update on that. Uh, I think it's really smart what we're doing with this and I appreciate the work on this. Absolutely. Thank you, Ricky. Smart. Yeah. We've got limited oh. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a big team. <laughs> who who just said? I'm sorry, I didn't uh, hear the next comment. That's right. Thank you, Commissioner. You're doing amazing things. Uh, this is Daniel Ellis with Disability Rights Tennessee. Hey, Daniel. Uh, hey, good morning. Um, good morning. I, I was just wondering uh, how 988 will be accessible to people who are deaf and use American Sign Language. That's a great question, and I will tell you that the group is discussing that. Um, so what I'd like to do, Daniel, is let you know when we issue the report, um, which should be soon coming. Great question. Thank you for asking that. It will be accessible. I just don't know the way in which it will, um, but but we will have that in the report. Commissioner. Yes, sir. I've had the privilege to be part of the 998 task force, and I'm really pleased that that NAMI and the voice of families is there. Uh, I just I'm going to put out maybe a small opportunity that does not involve spending money, <laughs> but um, we're doing a lot of work with CIT across the state. And what I'm finding there is that sometimes in local communities, the local law enforcement is really not aware always of what the services are that's available to them. Yeah, and I wonder also if we might have some kind of strategy in here, which I don't think has been brought up at the 988. There's so much bigger picture. The data part's important, and and I know you're getting to that to look at at trying to learn how to get dispatch data from 911 people. But I do think that um, we could do better to help local communities know what's available to them. That that sometimes people get in their silo, and I've kind of learned more about that through this process. Hey Jeff, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times we've gone to a community, we talk with the sheriff or we talk to the police, um, and they're like, "Oh, I didn't know you had these services available." Um, that that's a point well taken. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner. Hey Ben. Hey, uh, great to see you. Uh, even though you're in Chattanooga and not. Uh, here in Knoxville visiting, but uh, my question uh, for you is, you know, I, I'm really pleased to hear you say you want to take a, a data driven approach because mm -hmm. the data is kind of all over the place. Yes, uh, sir. <laughs> you know, um, 988 uh, or, or excuse me, 911 has data, uh, but are they all all the calls categorized the exact same why, way? No. No, law sir, enforcement they're, agencies. They're, yeah, then they're not <laughs> say something. Yeah. They're not, I mean, that's the whole point in not asking for something that we don't know what we need. Uh, well, yeah, they're, yeah. And, they're not and law, You're right. Yeah. And each law enforcement agency, you know, categorizes a mental health call differently from a suicide call. Um, and then we've got you know, of course, robust crisis services system data that shows number of, of calls 
uh, that our uh, crisis teams are taking and then how many they're uh, taking face to face versus telephonically and diverting. Um, and then the 988, or excuse me, the lifeline calls, you know, uh, I don't know what their data is. I, I wish we'd get to see it all kind of laid out so that uh, we here at the planning council could better understand all of that because, I, you know, different entities are using their position to say one thing and that's not necessarily uh, the most informed position. I guess I need to conclude with you. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, the data that we are collecting will all be laid out in this report. It's, um, it's so clear uh, that we do have great data. For those of you that are not aware of benchmarks for the crisis systems, I'll, I'll give a shout out to our Tennessee providers across the state that run our crisis teams. Uh, we basically divert and get people into the community around a 60 to 65 percent rate which means we have built out great community systems where you're not having to hospitalize people against their will uh, if you compare that to a state that's been touted as doing a great job and it's from the state that our deputy commissioner matt yancey has come from um, our diversion rates are even higher than georgia's um, i mean again you know when you look at the data um, you look and you see how well this system is being run um, and, and how well our teams are working together. Um, so thank you for that, Ben. Anyone else on this topic? So it's a very important topic. Well, Commission, I want to say uh, regarding the task force, it was impressive to see so many, so much diversity and, and so many skill sets at that table to come up with these uh, goals, uh, long-term and short-term. And I'm just grateful to be a part of that. And I think everybody's gonna be impressed by the outcome. Yes, sir. It's a fantastic group of people. Uh, it includes the, as you guys know, the education community, the TIN care, the employment community. I mean, it it's well um, represented. Of course, you guys that are leadership that are on that, we're so grateful for your input and your leadership. Um, anyone else on that topic? All righty, moving on to the next one. This is the update on our new block grant dollars that have come in. Um, I think y'all are well aware that uh, the federal government has decided to increase for a four year period the block grant funds to each of the states to try to respond uh, to the increased demand uh, based on COVID-19. I just wanna sort of set the stage on this. Um, research has shown that across the country and also in the state of Tennessee, that research was done by East Tennessee State University, uh, that depression and anxiety has increased by 40 to 45% across our state population. That's huge. We also know, Albert, I know you can speak to this, the increase in abuse and addiction has totally gone out the roof during COVID. Um, so I'm grateful, we are all grateful for the federal funds that we're getting. So as you all know, we got the $53 million that came in in 20, uh, 21 of May, and those dollars will allow us to expand the substance abuse prevention treatment grant, as well as our mental health grants. Uh, those dollars are gonna be invested in the continuum of services that we know are evidence-based uh, ranging from prevention, early intervention, treatment and recovery support. Uh, we will have to adhere to the set asides that SAMHSA has requested, which is uh, set asides for crisis, which we're already investing those dollars in our crisis system. That's why I said we've got some expansions there, uh, as well as first episode psychosis and substance use prevention. Uh, what I'd like to do before I continue to the next topic is ask Matt, Taryn, and Rob anything you want to add to this related to uh, timeframes, timelines, and, and what we can see over the next four years. Hey, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, this is Matt. Um, I'll, I'll start, then I'll let Rob and Taryn fill in the gaps. Um, 
you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, these funds could not come at a better time. Uh, like the commissioner was saying, uh, the impact of the pandemic on behavioral health has been significant to say the least. I, I was looking at the number of, of calls coming into the statewide crisis line this morning, and there has been a, a pretty significant uptick over the past several months. And, and I think we anticipate that trend to continue. As it relates to these block grant enhancements, um, one thing that I think is worthy of note is that we have really empowered block grant providers to tell us on how these funds can best support the people in the communities they serve. And, and I think that's a pretty novel approach that SAMHSA has given us really positive feedback on because certainly the local community providers and you as, as local leaders, you, you know your citizens and you know their needs better than anybody. So I think we were really thrilled to be able to take that approach. Um, it, it does take a minute to get the dollars out the door. So I, I think when we got notification of the SAMHSA funds, we were asked to submit applications and budgets. And there's been some back and forth between our department and SAMHSA around our budgets um, and our applications, but they are slowly being approved. And you will start seeing these dollars flow um, to a community near you as soon as we can get them out the door. So, Rob Tarn, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Just to reiterate Matt's kudos provider network, y'all have been awesome sauce in your responsiveness and your timeliness and your tolerance of deadlines in getting feedback from y'all on how we're going to get these dollars out the door. Um, yeah, it was, it was really neat to see how everybody got together and made that happen. So our appreciation for that responsiveness is very much makes a difference. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I guess the substance abuse side of um, SAMHSA is moving a tad bit slower than the mental health side. So um, we just got final approval last week on our first round of funding. And the second round of funding, we are still out um, um, for approval. So as soon as we can, as Matt said, as soon as we can get contracts going on that first round, we will. My team and I, we're meeting this week to, to talk about implementation on that first round of funding. And as soon as the second round is approved, uh, we'll be getting that um, those contracts out. So thanks. Thanks, guys. Any questions for our team on this? Any comments? Okay, going to the next one, Gail. I need some clarification from you. This question actually came from you. Um, and the question was around uh, discussing funds designated to treat opioid dependence. Um, and we weren't sure if you were referring to the opioid settlement money. So could you can you let me know what in particular you're you're wanting to know about? Sure, thank you. Um, and I probably have just a, enough information to be dangerous. So if I'm way off, just tell me I'm way off. Um, but the block grant dollars for uh, substance abuse is actually what my question is. And whether those are, because my understanding is those are federal dollars, and I didn't know if they are um, specific to respond to our opioid crisis or if there are opportunities to expand for other substance use Thank services. You. Thank you so much. That helps. Taryn, would you like to respond to that, dear? Yes, ma'am. So, um, and I'm going to make sure I understand. Are you talking about? The increase in the block grant that we just got for COVID, or are you talking about the opioid settlement dollars? I'm not, I'm not really the, clear. The COVID, Taryn, the COVID. Right, right, right. So those funds are to respond to COVID and the impact that COVID has had on our community as it relates to substance use disorders. So we will be implementing those strategies around COVID. Our proposal. All our proposals had to be around COVID and the impact that COVID has had on the community as it relates to overdoses and substance use disorder. So, Taryn, to her question, it's going to uh, be targeting more than just opioids. It will be targeting. Oh, yes, ma'am. So, it, so it's any any substance. Right, right, 
there there's a particular um, focus that we haven't had been able to do in a while on alcohol because mm -hmm. we don't do know that uh, alcohol use use disorder increased during COVID. So they are allowed. That's an allowable activity. So we're really excited to know that we have some funding that can be utilized for alcohol use disorders. But yes, it's it's going to be around all substances. It's not just targeted at opioids. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Um, any other questions or comments on that before I move on? All righty. Um, the next piece is the opioid settlement update. Um, there's been a lot of reporting that it's done. It's finished. It's been completed and it has not. <laughs> uh, there are still negotiations about the opioid settlement. Uh, we are working very closely with the attorney general's office as well as the governor's office uh, related to uh, when these dollars will be finalized and when our state will see those dollars. Uh, there has been in legislation the creation of a passing of the Opioid Abatement Council, and it sets up a structure for allocating any settlement funding that comes in. Uh, Zach Blair will be talking about that when he talks later today about our legislation proposals that passed last year and what will be impacting our state in the coming year. Um, on this one, I would say stay tuned. Uh, we do know that um, we've already had one of the uh, one of the leadership in the legislature uh, appoint their members to this council, but we're waiting on another part of leadership. We've got the cities and the counties. It's a lot of people that have to tell us who they want on the council. Um, our role, as uh, Zach will talk through, is to facilitate hire a staff. Uh, that will facilitate that process and make sure that all the cities and counties and communities across our state have equal and fair access to those dollars, which will also help Albert, as you know, uh, with the community uh, substance use providers. We're so grateful for the work of the AG, uh, for the work of his team uh, to try to get to a finalized settlement. But just to let you know, like currently, they're still negotiating with the cities and counties about whether or not they want a portion of that funding to go straight to them or whether they want it to be overseen by this council. Uh, so there will be more to come on that. Um, Albert, I'd like to thank you. Uh, you are our newly uh, appointed. Uh, I know that we're waiting on some of the paperwork on that, but, but you being willing to chair this group is a big deal um, this next year. We know we got more trials and tribulations coming. We were sort of hoping <laughs> that we would maybe decrease in the trials and tribulations, but many of you know that we're still dealing with COVID. Uh, with the Delta variant, it really is impacting individuals across our state and those that we serve. Um, so doing all we can in our office to make sure people know where to get vaccinated if that's what they choose to do. Um, and really, really hope that people will consider that because the Delta variant is so uh, much more um, impactful and contagious uh, than the other. Uh, one other thing, Albert, I'd like to say before I close up and open up for any other questions uh, is, you know, one of the things that I've talked a lot about over the years that I think makes our state so strong is, um, we talk to one another when there's an issue. Um, we talk to one another before we start throwing stones about what has or hasn't been done. Um, and, and one thing that I would really impress upon y'all, because it's easy with COVID fatigue to go to the worst case scenario. Um, we've got another season of roughness coming up and our providers are doing the best they can. I can assure you that and I can assure you our department is doing the absolute best it can. If you hear something that seems out of line, um, please, please speak up. <laughs> please don't allow rumors to continue. Please ask to get the data and the facts. Um, if there's somebody not getting what they need in the community, rather than spending your time talking about 
This person waited in the emergency room for two weeks. My gosh, we got our consumer affairs hotline. Can you call us? <laughs> uh, we can sort through whether that person has private insurance, whether they have 10 care, whether they're uninsured. Um, as you guys know, we are not responsible for the privately insured. That's not our group, but I can for sure get our individuals to com commerce and insurance and let them know the guy that's over that is a great person. Um, 10 care is absolutely at the table. If it's someone covered by 10 care, please uh, call our consumer affairs hotline and they'll make sure that that gets connected to 10 care. We are going to need as much as we can to band together because we're, we're, we're having some hard times now. Um, so that would be my plea, Albert, is just instead of focusing on negativity, uh, please try to focus on solutions. Um, and anybody that has called our office and asked for a solution, um, if you didn't get it, please speak up. Um, my understanding is whenever we get a call, we get it solved. It may not be to where you want it to be, but it's to the best of our ability. That's important. So, Albert. I'll uh, hand it back to you and, and have anyone that wants to ask or needs more information on anything. Uh, I'm here and our team's here to, to respond to that. Thank you, Commissioner. Absolutely. And I, I would first bear witness to what has been said about, by you, about you and your team and your efforts and your response time and your commitment to making sure that the needs of the citizens of this state is met. And so we salute you. I know many of the people on this call will salute you as well. And we support you 100%. Thank you. It means a lot. Yes, sir. So go, with that, I would like to take an opportunity to welcome some new members. Uh, Eula Whitaker, uh, Sarah Briggs as new members. Uh, the new chair for Region 4, uh, Jessica Foster, and Rebecca Woods, welcome. And the members welcome you well as well. Uh, we'll move on to reports. We'll start with Region uh, Council reports, starting with Region 1. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry about that. Region 1 um, met on August the 3rd uh, we ver via virtual platform. We had 21 in attendance. Um, this is Samantha Slagle. I am the vice chair of our region. Mr. Tim Perry is at um, uh, something going on in our corner of the state right now. He's, he needs to be where he's at, so we will miss him today. Um, for the rest of our report, we discussed how important it was to continue to look at the needs in our area, especially as we continue to struggle with workforce shortages for professionals and behavioral health as we continue to deal with COVID-19. We continue to work on applications to build enrollment in uh, that Region 1 Council and get all of our paperwork correct there. Frontier Health's Vonda Wagner and Christy Blaylock presented on the employment services program through the agency's ID and DD Rehabilitation Recovery Division. Uh, this program has been in existence with Frontier since 1989 and in the past year has hit new records with assisting people with SPMI issues to find and secure employment. Last year, this program assisted more than 270 people in our region with employment needs. With a statewide workforce shortage in so many different uh, industries, this program is very valuable resources to the Northeast Tennessee communities. The CMY subcommittee reported on additional expansion of school based and behavioral health uh, staff through Frontier and the hiring of a director of school based services, that'd be Ms. Kaylee Murphy. Um, crisis services reported a significant increase in crisis diversion since the state, since the start of the calendar year, especially with adolescents and children. They also reported on providing crisis training to many of the school systems in the area reported on the children's walk-in CSU is up and running right now in our region. The Legislative Committee reported on adding another member to the committee, uh, Lisa LaPolt with NAMI Tennessee. We're still looking for one more member to join that committee. Um, as of August the 3rd, we were. Becky Allen with Disability Rights reported on their client assistance program. Kirby Fye gave the department report and introduced Kristen Bellis 
Uh, Zach Blair gave a legislative review and Region 1's next meeting will be November the 9th to be determined on the modality of that setting. And that's all. You're muted, Albert. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Re Region 1? If not, we'll move on to Region 2. Thank you, Albert. My name is Mary Nell Osborne. I'm with Peninsula Behavioral Health and I'm the um, chair for Region 2. Um, I want to let you know our meeting is tomorrow in Region 2. And at the last um, state meeting, we reported on the um, efforts and work of this committee um, presenting strong legislative proposals as well as uh, being engaged in um, identifying needs in the region. So I'll wait to go over that, uh, what happens tomorrow at the next state meeting. Um, I do want to uh, thank Jan Cagle from Ridgeview. She has um, stepped up to serve as co-chair for Region 2, and she's going to be serving in this role until I believe June 30th of 2022, Jan. Um, she's completing, uh, she's accepted this position, which was left vacant by Amy Delinke, who moved to Michigan. Um, and so we'll be holding elections at our May 2022 meeting, which seems so far away, but all we know that is uh, rapidly approaching. Um, the challenges in our region are, are like they are across the state. The, COVID-19 variant is uh, rearing its ugly head. Our emergency departments are overrun. I work out in Sevier County right now. They have cots set up in the halls. Um, and the challenge that that's presenting for our behavioral health patients, um, if they have 10 care, of course, they're required to meet with mobile crisis, but they also have to be medically cleared and receive that COVID negative test at this point. Um, so I know that there's groups working to see what they can do to divert um, those patients from going to the emergency room and adding to that stress. Um, so we would we look forward to the solving of that problem quickly. Um, the calls are up for services in our outpatient clinics. Um, crisis calls are up, and there's simply not enough staff, especially in the rural areas. Um, where there was already a shortage of nurses and um, clinical licensed mental health professionals. Um, so we look forward to um, hearing some of those solutions. Um, I have some announcements for the region. Uh, East Tennessee Mental Health Association has a new hire serving as a mental health screening program director. Zanae Cummings, I think I'm saying that correctly. And they are also recruiting peers for the Peer Recovery Call Center with a CPRS being required. Um, they are going to hold, the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee is holding its uh, annual symposium, November 18th and 19th as a virtual conference. Again, it was successful last year and we'll be continuing in that format this year. Um, the National Association for the Dually Diagnosed, uh, the Tennessee chapter of that, um, and Tennessee is the only state in the United States that has a chapter of the National Association for Dually Diagnosed. We'll be having a virtual conference August 26th, um, and it looks like it's going to be an exciting conference. There are CEA, CEUs available, and registration can be completed on their website. Uh, and then looking ahead, Peninsula Behavioral Health in Knoxville will be holding arts formation this year. At this time, it is scheduled to be an in-person event. It is the only fundraiser for Peninsula Behavioral Health, and it will be held December 3rd and 4th. Um, at this time, it is scheduled to be at the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in Knoxville. Um, I'm not sure if that is going to change. Um, and I believe... That is it. All of our committees seem to have taken a small hiatus for the summer and they will be gearing up again in the fall. All right, thank you. Uh, Region three. 
Hi, uh, good morning. This is Gail Adato. I'm vice chair of region three here in greater Chattanooga. Our chair uh, had her second baby, so she is out on maternity leave. So we'll we'll give her that. Um, we met July 15th. There were 33 participants in our meeting and we did hold it virtually. Uh, Kirby Fry provided us with the department's a report and Zach Blair provided us with the legislative summary. We spent a significant amount of time. We're kind of going back to basics here in region three. Uh, we found that we have diverted pretty far over the years from the purpose of our regional committee and then our uh, subcommittees. And so we spent time going over what our role is to the department, you know, what our purpose is with the department um, and talking about membership. And I'm excited to report that the, the membership forms are, are coming in so that we're gonna have a, a real accurate list of active members that we can work with moving forward. So we're real excited about that. We're also excited that each of our subcommittees has a uh, chair, which is lacking before. Uh, Trish Cunningham is a CHI2 uh, coordinator and in our region, and she has taken on the responsibility of the chairing the adult committee. Amy Irvin is continuing to provide uh, chair responsibilities for our children and youth subcommittee, and Nicole Bates is continuing to be our chair of our legislative committee. All three uh, subcommittees are already working on our needs assessment for this next spring and a common need, uh, both really of the adult and children's subcommittee was how to access data so that we could boost up our needs assessments and really show um, the significance of the need. Um, and so we did get a lot of good information um, from Kirby and Zach at that meeting on where we can go on the websites and all. So that was really beneficial to our group to get that information. I'm really excited that Rachel Gearing um, with uh, uh, TSPN has taken on the role just all on her own of increasing our participation and, and membership with consumers. And so uh, we have a number of consumers that are now attending our meetings and did attend on July 15th and actually have filled out some membership applications. So um, that's that's where we are at. I know it's a little different report from what we normally have, but that's where we are. Uh, our next meeting is October 21st, and we will wait to hear whether that's in person or virtual. Okay, thank you. Region four. And this is Angie Thompson, I'm vice chair of region four. Uh, Shara couldn't be with us today. Um, we had our meeting on August the 4th. Uh, I presided, uh, Shara's had, um, Shara's been out for just a little bit. Um, we had a lot of new members in attendance, which was very encouraged, encouraging, and they were encouraged to join the committees. Uh, we reviewed the 2021 needs summary of multiple needs for regional councils and committees from that the department had sent out uh, and noted that while many of the needs had appeared through multiple years, that that could actually be used uh, in writing grants to demonstrate need and unmet need. So an, an attempt to really use the needs assessment that we provide to the state, um, not only for their purpose, but also other opportunities that we may be able to access through grants. Um, we also solicited feedback and thoughts on uh, the needs members have seen recently, and those included um, you know, the use of telehealth, but the continued need to use telehealth, and also the fact that some people didn't have the video, they only had the audio. Uh, and so, how and moving forward, that that would be continued or expanded. There was a concern expressed around pharmacists refusing to fill uh, prescriptions for MAT, and um, there was a um, there, the, 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 it was noted there was that continued negative impact of COVID nineteen on mental health, um, of families and children um, on the substance use issues, and some talk about how to support how support could be offered 
um, especially for children, uh, families with children with special needs. And also another area was the continued crisis with increases in overdoses and overdose deaths. Um, the legislative proposals were reviewed uh, by the region. Elliot Pinsley, our legislative chair, was able to do that. Uh, there was progress on the 988 number uh, that was discussed. Uh, it was announced that Metro Nashville had launched its Partners in Care co-response program as a pilot program on June 28, 2021. So it's been up for about going on six weeks now. And it's the co-response model where the police are trained in CIT and the clinicians are trained in police procedure. Uh, this pairs the clinicians uh, who are with the mental health cooperative uh, crisis response with the police officers uh, in the cars to respond. Um, and it was, um, it, you know, it's important that this is it's being done in two precincts right now. We're going to be evaluating the effectiveness of this and then looking uh, at ways to continue to uh, look at QI opportunities and expand. I will say that, um, you know, this really is a public private partnership and the people that were at the table or groups that were at the table when we started were our Department of Emergency Communications, uh, our emergency medical services, Metro Police, the health department, uh, the mayor's office, and the mental health co-op. Uh, and this work is being funded through allocations um, from the um, mayor's office and through some of it is, uh, the recovery funds and, and then some other funds that are available. Uh, so look forward to getting more information on that and getting some data on their outcomes. Uh, there's a community responder conference in October, which is focused on clinician responders uh, to emergency calls uh, without a police presence. And Elliot is interested in having a group attend around this, uh, particularly with what has been written up as and known as the HEALS model for Nashville. Um, and then it, it was uh, discussed that the role of the Policy Planning Council, uh, you know, as the um, needs assessment um, component, that was really emphasized. And Region 4 is going to begin its work uh, immediately on that. Last year we did this um, virtually, and we learned a lot of lessons from the way we proceeded and feel like we'll be able to do a better job this year. I think everything was a learning year for everybody last year. And then Zach Blair provided the 2021 legislative summary for, for the department. Thank you. Thank you. Region 5. Hey guys, it's Amber from Region 5. I'm reporting for Debbie. I'm the vice chair. Um, we met on August 5th via Microsoft Teams. Rebecca Provost Emmons with the department gave an update on the recovery courts throughout the region. Uh, Zach Blair presented on the 2021 legislative summary and Kirby Fye gave us a department update. The Region 5 Council is still in search of a secretary. Debbie challenged the members to recruit individuals from other parts of the region to attend the meetings, specifically service recipients, family members of service recipients, and members of anti-drug coalitions so that we can increase some of our uh, consumers on the council. The next meeting that we have will be held on November 4th at 9.30. That's all for us. All right, thank you. Region 6. Good morning, everybody. Richard Barber, Chair of Region 6. Uh, we met on July 13th. Uh, Kirby welcomed everybody, reminded everybody relative to the governor's executive order the meeting would be recorded and placed on the department website. April minutes were uh, approved. Tanya uh, Jen, who had been our region secretary for the last couple of years, had some reassigned work duties, so she had to resign. Then we went into some arm twisting and screaming and shouting to try to get somebody to be the secretary. And sweet Lori Hendon for care and counseling agreed to do that. Uh, pending her administrator's uh, uh, approval from Kerry. Uh, Kirby presented the department report. Zach Blair introduced Kristen Belloff as the new assistant director of legislation and rules and uh, related that she would be working with some of the regional councils as we move forward. Uh, Jerry Moore pre presented the children's committee report uh, related to the family guide to West Tennessee outdoors to get, uh, you know, with the um, with the pandemic and everybody cooped up, uh, the children's committee thought it was an excellent opportunity to get kids outside, get exercise, 
uh, address some of the stress that being on lockdown uh, provided. Matt Marshall uh, put, is putting together some state parks and some things to, to help with that. And also they're creating a, an online blog for kids related to mental health. Uh, we reported, the adult committee reported on uh, NAMI's presentation during the uh, uh, statewide adult uh, committee. There was some conversation around getting more service recipients involved and uh, how we can, we can uh, kind of build our legislative committee uh, said our, uh, then Julian Stone, who is uh, the executive director of Scarlet Road here in Jackson, that's a, a traffic uh, uh, a program to address uh, traffic victims, uh, gave uh, a presentation on what their mission was and, and how it could impact the populations we serve. Uh, next meeting set for October the 12th, and that's our report. Good to see everybody. Be glad when we all get back together. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Uh, Region 7. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bartholomew Allen. I am the chair for Region 7. Um, on July 27th, Region 7 met at 1130 a.m. via WebEx. Um, we had welcoming introductions and uh, we approved the minutes. Um, at that time, Kirby uh, provided updates for the from the department. And shortly following Kirby, uh, Zach Blair provided legislative summary um, that was approved and things that are still in the making. Um, we didn't have any uh, any presentations from any of the partners any, around the region. However, we do have one scheduled for our next meeting. Um, and that next meeting will be will occur on October 26, uh, Tuesday, October 26 at 1130 via WebEx. I think it's via WebEx. Um, however, if it's not, we will update everyone. Um, and that's it for Region 7. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now have the uh, adult committee. Hi, good morning. Thank you. This is Ginger Nassery reporting for the adult committee. We met on July 14th via phone call. We had 15 participants on the call along with um, four staff members. Uh, Lisa Helton, the Assistant Commissioner for Community Supervision with the Tennessee Department of Corrections, and Rebecca Bost Emmons, the Director of uh, Community Justice Services there at the department, uh, presented to the committee um, separately but complimentary on current programming and needs for justice involved individuals. Um, and gave us lots of information and things to think about as we begin to form our needs assessment for next year. Um, we are still looking for suggestions for our next meeting. Um, right now, we may have a speaker on uh, to focus on maternal mental health issues. Um, where that might be helpful to have a conversation about. We have several programs that are focused on maternal substance use disorders, but um, to focus specifically on maternal mental health um, might be something that we need to focus on in the world. What was that presentation again? This is the adult committee. Heard that part, but what was the presentation that was given to the adult committee? I'm sorry. Ginger, are you still there? Hi, Daniel. Yes. It's Kirby. Um, Rebecca Provost Emmons with the department did a presentation on the Office of Criminal Justice Services. She provided an, um, an FY22 update. And Lisa Helton with the Department of Correction provided a presentation on community supervision and updates um, as far as um, her program goes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're Sorry. welcome. I don't know what happened. Can y'all hear me now? We can. Okay, my apologies. Um, did you hear me say our next meeting is October 13th? No, ma'am, we, we can now. Okay. Okay. 
So at this point, we will call on the children committee. Good morning, Ricky Harris, um, chair of the children's committee. We met on August 4th and we had a, a lengthy presentation. We combined a couple of things, but we heard from Carrie Virgo and her team at the department, um, both about the SOCAP system of care across Tennessee expansion work, as well as some data on the success of the prior system of care work. Um, very, kudos to the department and all the providers who are part of that very, very strong outcomes and excited to see where that's going in the future. Um, and then we heard also from Carrie about the children's behavioral health safety net. And I will just take this opportunity to encourage all of you who work with families to, if you don't have information to reach out to Carrie at the department and get information and share information widely with families about the use of the children's behavioral health safety net. It, we know there are people out there who need it. They just need to know it's there. So um, our next meeting will be October 6th. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Next, the consumer meet uh, committee. Hey, this is Dina Savanas. Good morning. Thank you, Albert. I am the consumer advisor board chair. And we meet the first Friday of each month virtually, and we'd like to report that. We heard presentations from the following resource speakers in July. We had Stanley E. Taylor Jr. He's the assistant director of Spark Tennessee. They help people with disabilities gain access to adaptive technology and services. In August, we had Jacob Badal, the chief marketing officer for Brentwood Springs Detox. And we were inspired with recovery stories from the following. In July, we had Chris Smith. He's a lifeliner from Region 6 North. In August, we had Randall Burge, Region 3 Lifeline Project Coordinator. And we continue to set aside time each month to share wellness tips and just support one another. We've had some beautiful conversations recently on things such as self-love and what it might mean to an individual. Uh, how it might relate to compassion fatigue and burnout, the healing power of nature, and the art of doing nothing or being present. We switched from WebEx to Zoom back in May, and the Zoom link can always be found on the Tennessee.gov webpage for the Consumer Advisory Board if you're interested in joining. And we elected a new secretary, yay, yay, yay for that, Sarah Mays. She is the Hybrid Lifeline Peer Project Coordinator from Region 6 back in July, and I'm continuing on as chair for another term. Diane Sherrod is our current vice chair, and we're happy to have her. The CPRS 2021 virtual conference planning is going well. The dates are October 7th and 8th via Zoom, and our theme is rolling with resiliency, and we have finalized the workshops and the speaker selections. Our keynote is rolling with resiliency across the state of Tennessee with speakers from each grand region sharing their recovery stories. We are still seeking sponsors and volunteers and email was sent out with all of those details and the planning committee meets immediately following the CAB monthly meetings and you can contact Michelle Webster or myself if you'd like to participate in that. And finally, we have four membership openings, one in Region 2 for a person with lived experience in mental illness, two in Region 4 for a person with lived experience in mental illness, and one for a person with lived experience in substance use disorder, and one opening in Region 5 for a person with lived experience in mental illness. If you're interested in more information about the CAT, contact me, Dina Savanas, at csavanas at tamho.org, Kathy Haley or Michelle Webster. Our next meeting is Friday, September 10th, due to the Labor Day holiday coming up from 11 to 11 a.m. Central Time, and you are welcome to join. We hope to see you there. Thank you, Albert. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm exact, uh, Albert Richardson, and I'll do the report for the Executive Committee Executive Committee met uh, jointly with the Legislative Committee on June the 23rd um, by teams. Uh, this meeting was a follow-up from the May 20, uh, uh, May 2021 meeting in which legislative proposals were recommended to move forward for the commissioner uh, consideration. At this meeting, Zach Blair provided an update on five proposals, proposals that were considered to move forward. Debbie Hillen, Legislative Committee Chair will now uh, 
move forward with that report. Debbie? Hey, Albert. Debbie had to hop off the call, so I'm going to give the report on behalf of the Legislative Committee. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Uh, one second. Let me pull that up. Okay. The Legislative Committee met jointly with the Executive Committee on June 23rd via MS Teams. The meeting was a follow-up from the May 21 meeting in which legislative proposals were met, well, excuse me, were recommended to move forward for the commissioner's consideration. At this meeting, Commissioner Williams thanked the committee for their hard work and well-written proposals that were submitted for consideration. She spoke to one specific proposal, Tennessee Behavioral Health Workforce Preparedness Act, which she spoke on in great, de in great detail at the beginning of this meeting, and advised the committee that the department has created a workforce development work group in partnership with TenCare to address the workforce issue. The first meeting of the work group was held on June 15th. Zach Blair then provided an update and outcome of each of the remaining legislative proposals that were submitted to Commissioner Williams for consideration. The Tennessee Behavioral Health Services Accessibility and Modernization Act. This proposal was not moved forward for governor's office consideration. However, Zach will speak with Deputy Commissioner Yancey regarding the telehealth issues brought forward in the proposal. The Annual Behavioral Needs Assessment Enhancement Act. This proposal was also not moved forward for governor's office consideration. Addressing stigma through changing the department name. This proposal was not moved forward for off governor's office consideration. And the Fentanyl Overdose Prevention Act, this, the committee was advised that this proposal will be submitted as a legislative proposal to the governor's office for further consideration. And that is all I have. Okay, thanks Kirby. All right, this time we'll have initiative uh, creating housing initiative chief, uh, new rule. Uh, I'll let you take over at this point. Uh, thank you, uh, Albert, and if you have to just give me a quick moment to share my screen. While well, Nuru is getting his screen on, I will tell you Nuru. Nuru is the director of Office of Housing and Homeless Services. Thank you, Albert. Uh, can everyone see this screen? And maybe Albert can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Great. Thank you. Um, so we are very grateful for this opportunity um, to present to you guys to share a little bit about what we've been what we've been up to in housing, particularly with the Creating Homes Initiative. My name is Mary Govan. I serve as the director for the Office of Housing and Home Services, and joining me today are the Director of Regional Housing Facilitators, Jamie Price, and the Office of Housing and Home Services Program Manager, Kristen Spangler. To help illustrate what she is about, I'm going to provide a brief description of how it works. Our Director of Communications, Matthew Perry, produced this wonderful animated video. Take a look. Tennessee's Creating Homes Initiative, a two-decade history of housing Tennesseans living with mental health, substance use, and co-occurring disorders. Started in 2000 by now Commissioner Marie Williams with leadership and support from Commissioner Elizabeth Rukeyser, the Creating Homes Initiative was the seed planted that has grown to shelter tens of thousands of Tennesseans. The model leverages seed funding from the state to draw on other sources for a multiplier effect, and the result has been tremendous. Since the year 2000, she has created more than 28,000 housing opportunities and leveraged more than $850 million. Here's how it works. The state provides the framework, incentives, and regional housing facilitators. Local and regional groups identify needs and prioritize projects with an emphasis on permanent housing opportunities. The regional housing facilitators work with grantee agencies who construct or rehabilitate, and then own and operate the housing. The model has been so successful for people with mental health challenges and co-occurring disorder that Governor Bill Lee and the Tennessee General Assembly added extra funding to expand it to addiction recovery housing in 2020. With regional housing facilitators and consumer housing specialists covering the entire state, the Creating Homes Initiative is positioned to support the resiliency of Tennesseans for decades to come. Want to learn more? Visit our website 
tn.gov slash behavioral dash health slash chief. Video. Thanks to Matthew for putting that together. So, as I mentioned in the video, she started in the year 2000 as a product of a very own Commissioner Williams' vision and leadership and support of then Commissioner Elizabeth Ruth Heiser. $2.5 million was appropriated for she to serve as seed funding, and then Commissioner Williams forged a critical partnership with the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. THCA's trust. And the vision and recognition of the importance of this initiative resulted in their commitment of $2 million towards Chief. The next 20 years was so successful that starting in fiscal year 2020, Governor Lee and the General Assembly appropriated $3 million to expand Chief to include a specific focus on the creation of quality, safe, and affordable housing. Permanent housing opportunities for, for Tennesseans who are uh, in recovery from opioid and other substance abuse, uh, substance abuse recovery. This is known as Chief 2.0. We expanded the Chief team to include seven Chief 2.0 regional substance use housing facilitators. And can everyone hear me? Or are we having trouble hearing? Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Forgive me. Let me see if I can speak up a little bit. I may have to turn around just a little bit to my mic, but you guys please watch the slide. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, slightly better on the room. All right, I'll try to speak up a little bit louder. Y'all forgive me. My setup here is that my microphone is a little bit away from the screen. Uh, but as mentioned in the cheat video, she started in the year 2000 as a product of our very own Commissioner Williams, her vision and the leadership and support of then Commissioner Elizabeth Ruth Kaiser. $2.5 million was appropriated to, to, to CHI to serve as seed funding. And then Director Williams forged a critical partnership with the Tennessee Housing Development Agency. THCA's trust and vision and the recognition of the importance of this initiative resulted in their commitment of $2 million towards CHIEF. The next, the next 20 years resulted in so much success that in year fiscal, in fiscal year 2020, Governor, Governor Lee and General Assembly appropriated $3 million to expand CHIEF to include a specific focus on the creation of quality, safe, affordable, permanent housing opportunities for Tennesseans and substance use recovery. This is known as Chi 2.0. We expanded the Chi team to include seven new Chi 2 regional substance use housing facilitators and seed money to leverage resources across the state to create new projects to house folks across Tennessee. We reached out to THDA to expand our partnership and again, THDA committed funding to the amount of $3 million to match our first year's appropriation. We're so very grateful to THDA for standing with us over the years with the Trading Home Committee. Now with just over 20 years under its belt, the Trading Home Commission has leveraged over $850 million to create more than 28,000 new housing opportunities for the folks who serve across our great state. To share more about our chief team, I'd like to hand it over to Ms. Jean Price, our Director of Regional Housing Facilitator. Jean? Good morning. Thank you. Uh, our team does consist of 13 regional housing facilities. And it is our job to learn our region, our continuing care, our uh, public housing authorities, our community housing developments. And we all like to work together to create permanent housing for people with mental illness and co-occurring disorders and now this recovery housing. Next slide. As you can see, this is one of our trainings that we had in Kingsport a, a few years ago. 
Uh, this is towards the end of a three day training and sharing with one another. It's like a one field facility is facilitator and has a lot of knowledge in one area. She's able, he's able to share it with the team. And so it's always real important for us to take a team approach and all of us work together as a team. The next slide will show you a map of the, and the names of people across the state that work together as the facilitators for G1 and G20. Nehru? Thank you, thank you, Jamie. And you will see this on your copy of the slide, but we will also send a link to, to Kirby to share with you guys so you have this resource to contact the regional housing facilitators in your region. So now that we give you a quick breakdown of Chi, we'd like to show you a few photos to help illustrate Chi at work. During fiscal year 21, the Chi 2.0 grant resulted in creation of several new quality permanent housing sites for Queen's seniors and recovery from substance use disorder. Among them include some of our new, our new grantees. And as you can see here on the left, left hand side, this is uh, our wonderful partner. Mr. Richard Barber, Executive Director from Aspro Recovery Center. They're pictured with our Chief 2.0 Regional Substance Use Housing Facilitator, Jason Fosaway for Region 6, and their funding partner, Dr. Ronald Kirkland, to create uh, new housing for, for uh, women in recovery. In the center, you'll see our Regional Housing, regional housing Facilitator for Region 4 and 5, uh, pictured here with Ms. Lynn Nolan, who is Executive Director for Recovery Community Incorporated, creating housing in Sumner County. And finally, on, on the right side, we have also Bill versus Warren, our Regional Housing Facilitator for Regions 4 and 5 there, with Executive Director Mary Laramore of Butterfly Moments, who created housing for veterans in Montgomery County, and pictured there is a developer partner of um, Singletary Construction. Our regional housing facilitator, as Jeannie explained, worked very hard to establish and keep, keep con uh, relationships and forge partnerships to create housing. And this takes a lot of organic work and effort. Uh, as you can see there on the far left, we have our Teaching regional housing facilitator, substance use housing facilitator for region one, Miss Wendy Ramsey, pictured there at a groundbreaking ceremony with Kingsport Housing as they were awarded the THDA G2 grant. In the center, we have our very own director of regional housing facilitator presenting on T at UT Knoxville at a SAMHSA led workshop. And I gotta say that she stole the show. And on the right, this is uh, actually a collaborative effort between two of our facilitators, Mr. Jack Blum of Region 4 and Greg Keeling of Region 5, our substance use housing facilitators there in Stewart County, uh, meeting with their mayor and uh, uh, connecting and networking at a luncheon. So these next few slides show some quick pictures of uh, some of the housing that was established. Kirkland House, again, would uh, ask for recovery. And this is in Madison County. 12 women will be served here in recovery. This picture, these pictures here are for Recovery Community, Community Incorporated, who created housing and housing for individuals in recovery in Summer County. And this will house 22 individuals. And thirdly, and this is not all of them, but just to give you a snapshot, this is new apartments being new constructed in Montgomery County with the leadership of Butterfly Moments for veterans in substance use recovery. To share a little bit about an expansion of our other programs, I will turn it over to Christy Spangler. Christy? 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Nehru. My name is Chrissy Tangler. I am the program manager uh, with the Office of Housing and Homeless Services, and I have the privilege of leading our intensive long term support program, or for short, our ILS program. Um, so ILS is separate from our CHI program, but they very much overlap because it provides a safe and affordable permanent supportive housing. Uh, this program uh, serves those who are discharging from our regional mental health institutes. And these folks may not be able to discharge from our hospitals or definitely not in the time frame they're able to with having our ILS um, program. Um, they provide wraparound services for their residents so that they're able to successfully discharge into the community and stay in the community. Uh, they continue with their mental health services. They may um, provide a, not, not really assistance, but maybe prompts and um, reminders to complete activities of daily living. They provide activities throughout the day and just a good um, routine uh, for them so that they can have that um, supportive services out in the community. Our last group homes are licensed by the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services as mental health adult supportive residential facilities. Uh, we currently have 11 ILS group homes across the state. And with those 11 group homes, we have a total of 113 bed. This picture on the slide is um, a picture of the living room at our ILS home in Nashville, which is operated by Tennessee Voices. This is actually um, at their open house, so very early um, in that process. Next uh, slide. Thank you. Um, because our ILS program um, was so successful, we were able to expand that program during fiscal year 2019 to support discharges coming out of Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute. And we have two group homes to support those discharges. One is in Nashville and is operated by Tennessee Voices, and the other is in McMinnville, and that one is operated by Volunteer Behavioral Health Care. And between those two group homes, um, we have a total of 20 beds. And then last fiscal year in 2021, we were able to offer another expansion with this program to support discharge from Western Mental Health Institute. Um, and we're really excited to be able to partner um, once again with Tennessee Voices to operate that group home in Jackson. And we will have 20 additional beds with that expansion. So we'll. This fiscal year in 2022, we'll have 133 beds across the state. So we're really excited about that because before this expansion and the one in 2019, we did not have um, ILS homes to support those two regional mental health institutes. So we're we're just really happy that we're now able to do that. Um, this slide or um, this this picture on the slide is another picture of the ILS home in Nashville on that open house. So that is our ILS program in a nutshell, um, but I will go ahead and hand it back over to Mary so he can talk about another expansion that's happening in the office. You can tell we're doing a lot of work. And so, as, 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 so we plus uh, shared a little bit about what we've been up to. How about what's next? We're very excited to be able to again expand C to include C 3.0, which is dedicated to expand its focus for Tennesseans for mental, with mental illness and or substance use disorder who re enter the community from prisons and jails or have been previously incarcerated. Thanks to Governor Lee and the Tennessee General Assembly, we will receive the state new state appropriation towards this effort of 3.6 million. So what are our next steps with this? We'll be releasing an announcement of funding in the coming in the coming month, possibly in most likely in September. Um, and 
our regional housing facilitators are at work and will be at work at several in several aspects to make sure our expansion is successful and the work that they do to communicate and network and partner with you in the region are successful. That includes training and education to, be, to better equip them with knowledge uh, and expertise in serving the individuals who are re-entering our community from prisons and jails. Uh, working at community engagement to help identify needs respectively to regions and communities. Strategic leveraging of resources. We understand that our funding that we have available is just a small part of the big pie. So that our facilitators are working increasing their skills at leveraging additional resources to make Chi as successful as it has been. And they'll also be working to establish these relationships and sit at the table with folks who are looking at creating new housing to develop effective funding applications. And for both our Office of Housing and Homeless Services and our regional housing facilitators, we will collectively be working to fortify relationships and networks. That includes the optimizing and sustaining existing partnerships like we have with THDA and so many other entities across the state and establishing and nurturing new partnerships, for example, the Tennessee Department of Corrections and so many others that work so well in the reentry service delivery. We're so excited to have been able to accomplish, partner, accomplish what we've done through partnerships across the state. But we put together a few short clips of a few videos from our new show, TDMHSAS Cribs. Produced by our very own Matt. On the end, we'll see features from recovery community housing facility, Casco Recovery Center, and Butterfly Moments. So, take a look. All I could think about was. Like I was sitting on these couches and watching football and eating chicken wings or something. So I think this is uh, a great place to call home. You have an outdoor patio and a lot of land back there. Probably will do a garden. Right? Follow me to the group room. This is our group room. We'll be having men's groups and MRT, some therapeutic groups in here. Um, we are using utilizing partners in Sumner County for intensive outpatient and mental health services and all the ancillary services in the Over on this side is where they'll be able to have their house meetings, be able to do different groups with the ladies. We do a lot of different uh, life management skills, a lot of relapse prevention groups in this uh, level of care, and the ladies will be able to all sit here comfortably. And then when we're not doing groups, they'll be able to sit and enjoy themselves their free time. Uh, they'll be able to work on different kinds of stuff, work while they're here. Um, they could meet with their sponsors in the group room. And then over on this side, we have the kitchen area where they will be able to make all their meals. We are at North Ford Street in Clarksville. These are apartments for veterans with substance use and uh, mental illness. The one bedroom, they have the washer, dryer, all the appliances are included. The horizon out the back door is amazing. It's a recovery community. These homes are here to provide a community for veterans who are ready to do something uh, different in their lives. Whatever their situation, enough space to feel safe and secure. This is permanent housing. This isn't something temporary. This is not a Band-Aid fix. This is permanent. So, well, as you can tell that we are hard at work across the state to make these things a reality and with that hard work to be able to see such progress like these to come to fruition and we're talking about the quality of housing, it really makes you feel good about the work that's being done. We want to thank Commissioner Williams and Deputy Commissioner Matt Yancey for the opportunity to carry the baton for Chi in the Office of Housing and Home Services. And thanks to the council and to the community for the partnership which has made she successful. I will close with this quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has.
This is our contact information for all of the members of the Office of Health and Homeless Services, as well as our director of the Housing Facilitated Community Projects. Uh, we'll leave this, uh, this up for the moment, and this is also included in your copy of the slide. Thank you so much, and thank you, Kirby, for the opportunity. Okay. Nero, let me say you guys do a great job. Please take the opportunity to take, uh, to take the information down and use it uh, in your regions. Uh, it's a benefit to the state uh, and to, uh, individual regions. At this time, we will have uh, Zach Blair uh, do the legislative summary. Good morning, uh, Albert, and uh, members of the statewide council. Um, always great to be with you and excited to be here uh, to talk about the legislative summary this year. I'll uh, apologize for the folks that have had to sit through this a couple times already uh, who may be on the regional councils, um, but uh, hopefully this will be uh, useful information um, to a lot of folks and i um, excited to again be with you again this week. Um, Hopefully, um, I will be able to do something to elicit a, an applause from Rob Cotterman at some point. I've seen him do that a couple of times. I'm afraid my content's not uh, as exciting um, as uh, some of the other things Rob's responded to. So maybe, uh, maybe I can uh, get a, get an applause from Rob at some point during, or or a sad face um, as he just did. So I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my screen and the legislative summary. Um, you likely have seen this document uh, included in your materials. Um, it is available on our website. Um, these highlights are, are mine uh, for the purpose of sharing specific pieces of legislation with you uh, for this meeting. Uh, but please feel free to pull this up. Um, there are links to the public chapters, uh, the text of the bill, um, things that, that you might be interested in reviewing further. Um, also, I will say if you have uh, questions about a specific bill that we discuss or one that's on the list that we uh, don't discuss today, um, please let me know at the end and uh, we'll be able to go into more detail about that. Um, on the first page of the legislative summary, uh, the very first uh, piece of information that you see is a House Joint Resolution um, that is dedicated to the memory of uh, Ellen Abbott. And um, I know that most of the folks that are on the statewide um, council here are uh, well aware of Ellen's work and um, her meaningful contributions to criminal justice uh, reform and efforts in Tennessee. Um, she is sorely missed by our department. And um, we were very, very thrilled that the legislature chose to honor her in this way with a joint resolution. So encourage you, uh, especially those who uh, knew Ellen and worked with Ellen uh, to review that, um, to see the honor that um, the legislature bestowed upon Ellen um, during her uh, unfortunate passing at the beginning of the year. Um, so that's there. Um, moving on to um, important things, but uh, obviously less heavy than um, that, that first uh, item on the list here, uh, mental health related uh, legislation uh, that was uh, passed during the uh, sessions this year. Um, Senate Bill 753 and House Bill 81 uh, was a bill that our department proposed and the governor included um, in his uh, legislative package uh, for this year. And uh, I saw Senator Massey on here earlier, and we are always grateful um, for her support when she uh, helped shepherd these pieces of legislation through for us. And I wanna thank her for doing that. Um, this bill, um, there are a couple things and, and there are a lot of um, administrative and cleanup things in nature, but the last two points um, are things that I think are really important to this particular body. Uh, the first is, um, again, the second to last bullet um, codifies the membership structure for the regional planning and policy councils. Um, the regional planning and policy councils have actually never been in state statute and uh, wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity to clarify that um, the requirements that the statewide council has for appointment of members 
uh, we really hope, and I've heard a lot of the uh, council chairs talk about um, their desire to increase consumer and consumer family member and uh, past consumer um, members of those councils. And it just um, states that the um, regional councils that are citizen based and, and locally controlled um, are to strive to ensure that a majority of their members are service recipients, family members of service recipients or past service recipients. So um, obviously it's not the same um, requirement that the statewide council has due to federal requirements and state law requirements, but wanted to codify that and make sure that the, um, the effort and the spirit of that is uh, continues down to the state, to the uh, regional councils. And finally, there was some, um, a little bit of confusion in the statute with the telehealth bills that were passed and uh, the nature of those that licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors um, are, were, that there were, uh, like I said, some confusion by the board, whether or not they were authorized to practice telehealth due to a, a statutory provision. This bill uh, clarified and made it very clear um, and and spelled out that those licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselors are authorized to provide telehealth and telemedicine services um, in the same manner that many other healthcare practitioners in the state uh, are able to do. So we're excited to make sure that that was a, a clarification and, and some certainty around that as we continue to navigate some uncharted waters in the way services are delivered in Tennessee. Moving on to page two, um, and Commissioner spoke a little bit about this at the beginning uh, of her presentation, but Senate Bill 739, House Bill 73, um, at the bottom of this list is the K-12 Mental Health Trust Fund Act. And while the budget appropriated the amount of money, um, this bill set up the structure and gave direction to the department on how uh, those funds were be, to be expended and allocated. So um, the K-12 Mental Health Trust Fund was set up. You have um, a 10% of that initial appropriation that goes into the account where services can be paid for immediately. And then 225 million uh, of the initial appropriation uh, will be used uh, to form the corpus of a trust that will grow on an annual basis and the proceeds from that trust will then be uh, be transferred to the other account to allow for continued investment in services, prevention, interventions uh, for K-12 students who have needs in the mental health sphere. Um, so it's very, very grateful and excited that the governor and the General Assembly um, were creative in using non-recurring budget funds uh, to create a uh, recurring funding source for mental health treatment for uh, that population. And, and so we're very excited that that's there and um, you will likely be hearing more and more about that in the coming months. And um, obviously we're excited to see what kind of um, proceeds that results in with that large of investment. So, um, like I said, extremely grateful that uh, a quarter of a billion dollars um, was devoted for that purpose. Moving on to page four, um, this bill at the very top, Senate Bill 207, House Bill 215, um, is very relevant to those who provide housing um, in their communities um, for uh, specifically those that are uh, recovering from substance use disorder. Um, it does not require licensure by the department. I think that's been a confusion um, that's been uh, Kind of out there related to this bill, but it does require that um, a lot of recovery residences um, that are not funded by either a federal or state department um, receive some type of certification to receive referrals from certain sources. So, uh, really encourage those that are in the recovery residences uh, sphere to uh, review that and um, take a look and, and make sure that. Um, you are uh, aware of those requirements and uh, have a path forward uh, for that. The uh, effective date for that is delayed, so obviously it didn't go into effect immediately, so there is some time uh, to come into compliance, but um, that's something that's important for those um, who are in uh, this world to be mindful of. Moving down to the next bill, Senate Bill 558, House Bill 1132, 
commissioner also touched on this point. This is the Tennessee Opioid Abatement Council Act that creates the Opioid Abatement Council um, that will determine how uh, to appropriately allocate funds that come to the state uh, from the opioid lawsuit settlements. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's uh, my dog, and he has decided to uh, participate in this conference call, unfortunately. Um, he likes to do that on most of my calls, and uh, I will always apologize that uh, he has interjected himself, but I'll do my best to keep him quiet. But the uh, the Opioid, uh, Opioid Abatement Council, um, you will hear more and more about. Uh, like Commissioner said, those settlements aren't finalized. Uh, don't know the, uh, the amount of funding that's available uh, to do that, um, but we continue to work with the Attorney General's office and the relevant parties that are... Uh, appointing those members to um, make sure that that uh, those funds are used wisely and that they go to the purpose of abatement um, for the opioid crisis in Tennessee. Senate Bill 1118, House Bill 490. Um, Senator Massey will again be very, very familiar with this piece of legislation. Um, she had an, another bill related to medical cannabis during the session and uh, parts of her bill were included in this. Um, I will start with the first part. The first bill, or the first part of the bill, creates the Medical Cannabis Commission. Uh, does not legalize medical cannabis in Tennessee, but creates a commission uh, that will report to the legislature regarding a medical uh, cannabis program in Tennessee in the event that uh, marijuana is descheduled uh, from Schedule One on a uh, on the federal level. Um, and additionally, um, going back to the the portion that Senator Massey. Um, pushed for this year. Um, it raised the level of certain substances that contain THC for folks with certain health um, issues and um, various requirements are required for those that um, are wanting to take advantage of this. So um, again, we I think as um, time goes on, we will continue to see a lot of um, legislation related to medical cannabis as um, as things continue to progress, um, and uh, this is something that we wanted to make sure that uh, folks were aware of, and things that um, people um, will will want to engage in um, as that commission forms and they potentially take public input in making a plan for Tennessee related to medical cannabis. Senate Bill 1265, House Bill 508, at the top of this page. Um, this bill. Um, basically memorializes uh, portions of the governor's executive orders that have happened during the pandemic. Um, it allows unlicensed graduates uh, and students who are in medical training programs to be able to receive their, their hours and uh, graduate requirements uh, by providing telehealth services under the supervision of a licensed professional. So this was something that uh, folks during the pandemic recognized uh, was a challenge and a barrier for some students trying to get their hours. Um, but uh, th this was memorialized um, in state law now, allowing those students and graduates in training programs to be able to provide telehealth and telehealth services to get their uh, hours for the purpose of getting licensed. On page eight, um, the first two bills are sunset laws, and um, most of you are aware, and many of you participated in this process. Um, every governmental entity in Tennessee goes through a review process by the comptroller's office and later by the legislature that extends or um, potentially could um, sunset a department. Um, and we were very grateful that the legislature extended both the department and the statewide planning and policy council for an additional four years. So that's an exciting thing. Very grateful to the legislature um, for allowing us to continue to do the important work that we do and the important work of the planning and policy council. Um, so, um, like I said, periodically, uh, every state agency goes through this exercise and, and uh, basically in, in 2024, we'll start that process again. Um, and we appreciate the, the support of the council as we went through that process. And again, are grateful to the legislature uh, for extending both of our uh, department and our uh, planning and policy council. Senate bill 773, house bill 779 at the end of this page, um, there was a bill that was introduced um, for pretty much every department 
that had an issue that needed to continue past the pandemic that had been addressed in executive orders. Um, most of the bill um, here was actually um, related to the Department of Labor, um, but there was one provision uh, for our um, folks that are transporting mental health patients that are going through the involuntary uh, emergency admission process for hospitals. And it simply allows that transportation agent to accept an electronic copy of, certi of a certificate of need uh, when they're making that transport. Previously in state law, it required a hard copy. And as you know, with um, certain um, changes to service delivery through telehealth, teleaudio, um, that sometimes a paper copy wasn't always generated. So it simply allows that um, transportation agent to be able to accept an electronic copy rather than um, having to obtain a hard copy. On page 10, um, Senate Bill 767, House Bill 784, and then the next bill, Senate Bill 768, House Bill 785, or two that I will kind of talk uh, two together. And um, these were very um, large criminal justice reform bills. Um, these were priorities of the governor. Uh, I've told all the council, the regional councils that I presented to, I don't uh, pretend to be an expert in criminal justice in any way. And I know there are people um, on this call and on our staff that have a lot more knowledge about uh, that system than I do and would encourage anyone in the criminal justice uh, realm to uh, take a look at these. But the first bill uh, deals with uh, community-based alternatives to incarceration uh, so that uh, people are hopefully diverted from the criminal justice system when other services and appropriate supervision uh, is available to them. And then the second bill um, relates to reentry. So those that are um, incarcerated or um, who are soon to be released, those um, services uh, are, are made available to them to plan for that so that their reentry is a success back into the community. Uh, so again, very um, critical pieces of legislation was the governor's. Uh, I would I would say probably the governor's top priority uh, this year, and um, those two bills are highlighted uh, on this uh, for that reason. That is the last bill on my list. Um, obviously, there are many more that are on this list, and um, would be happy to take any questions uh, about those. And I can go to the specific page. Um, I appreciate the uh, reactions from Rob throughout my presentation. He always uh, warms my heart uh, when, uh, when he's participating in our uh, conference calls, um, but I'm happy to uh, take any questions or uh, discuss any other items at this time. Thank, thank you, Zach. Um, one of the things I wanna remind the members, please, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat box or uh, send them to Kirby and he, she'll get them to the presenters so they can respond to you uh, for the sake of time. Okay. And if there are questions that are in the chat box, unfortunately with my screen share, I can't see them uh, right now, but if uh, Kirby is on and can see those, if there are questions in the chat box. I don't see I any, see. Zach. Okay, thank you. I don't see, thank you. Okay, thanks guys. We'll move on to the Office of Hospital Services General Update. Melissa Sparks, Deputy Assistant Commissioner, Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services Division of Hospital Services. Melissa, do you need me to share your presentation for you? Um, I'm hoping that I can figure this out. <laughs> um, you got it. You can see it. I see the screen. It says you're sharing. Con there you go. I see it. Okay. Hold on one second. Figure out how to expand it. The slide shows. Nope. Click on slideshow. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to stop and then reshare. Hold on one second. The buttons were getting in the way.
technology is your friend, Melissa. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. No. I don't normally have this much trouble. I do apologize. Looks you good. got it, Melissa. We can okay, see it. Awesome. awesome, awesome. You got it. Well, my name's Melissa Sparks, and thank you so much for allowing me a moment to give you some updates. I am very fortunate and honored and blessed to work under the leadership of Ty Thornton, who is our chief of staff and hospital operations, as well as uh, our commissioner, uh, Commissioner Williams. I feel so blessed to be able to work under their leadership. Um, and they are um, just awesome as it relates to helping with operations of our army ties across the state. Um, just to give you some updates, uh, we, we did have a very unusual year last year, of course, because of COVID, um, which, you know, required at times quarantining of patients um, and, of course, uh, social distancing when we did have patients. Um, so I do think that that impacted our overall admissions last year. We did have 7,350 uh, overall admissions across the four RMHIs. Um, however, that's that's probably the lowest number of admissions I've seen in several years. Um, but I really contribute that to the impact of COVID-19. Um, overall presentations were also lower for fiscal year 21 as compared to uh, fiscal year 20. Um, again, that could be related to the impact of COVID, although it's just uh, not known um, for sure if, if COVID was the reason for that. In addition to those served at a regional mental health institute, <laughs> there were another 3,368 admissions at our East Tennessee hospitals that we contract with in regions one and two. Um, they serve uninsured uh, individuals in those areas and um, have been a huge uh, contributing factor to our ability to serve the needs of Tennesseans across the state. Um, we do continue to require mandatory mask wearing um, for all staff that work in the RMHIs. Of course, we continue to screen staff every day as they come in, checking temperatures, uh, trying to limit um, the transmission of COVID to the extent possible. Um, we did start visitations with restrictions for our subacute population uh, back in April, although as we see the Delta 19 variant begin to surge, uh, we may have to consider um, going back to no visitation, but right now we are still allowing that for our subacute population. Subacute meaning that somebody has been in the hospital for longer than 90 days. Um, approximately 61% of all of our staff have been vaccinated, which is a pretty good rate, um, although we would like to see that increase uh, over the next coming months. Um, our seclusion and restraint rate, rates remain below uh, national average, and we do see occasional spikes, where, which are generally attributable to just one or two individuals that have a multitude of um, episodes that require either seclusion or restraint. We were also able to uh, decrease the utilization of seclusion and restraint at two of our facilities um, as they have been really focusing many of their efforts on trying to reduce uh, the occurrences of having to seclude or restraint an individual. Um, we saw a huge impact to ECT um, services as it relates to COVID. None of our RMHIs actually provide this service in-house. Uh, they contract with other uh, providers in their areas to uh, provide ECT services. Uh, last year, I believe uh, we had 56 individuals that received ECT, but this past year in fiscal year 21, 
uh, only one individual was sent out for ECT services, but that was primarily because they shut down the service due to the pandemic. Uh, so there was very limited availability of this service um, for many months. Um, we are very pleased though that, for, you know, for something so bad as a pandemic, we did have some positive outcomes as it relates to really being able to move our telehealth connections. Um, we are now connected with more ERs and jails across the state than ever. And uh, during fiscal year 21, there were actually 2,840 admission evaluations that were conducted via telehealth, which is the highest number we've had since telehealth began in 2010. Um, so we're very pleased with that. Um, we are also, um, although we um, are only responsible for uninsured individuals, we were able to provide uh, psychiatric inpatient care uh, to 56 individuals in our East Tennessee contracted facilities that are under the age of 18. Um, we're very fortunate that most children in Tennessee are 10 care covered and are able to be served in the private facilities. Um, but we do offer that safety net um, in our contracted East Tennessee hospitals for those rare occurrences in which a child is uninsured. Just a little bit about what's going on at our, each of our facilities. This is the beautiful Memphis Mental Health Institute, obviously located in Memphis. It's a 55 bed facility. And some of the things they're working on right now uh, in, include addressing 30-day uh, readmits and trying to decrease the average uh, rate uh, through ongoing efforts uh, of interdepartmental work group that they've established there. Um, they've also recently participated in a mock joint commission survey so that we can uh, assist them with uh, joint commission readiness as they are due this year uh, for an actual unannounced joint commission survey. Um, they have been working very hard uh, on reducing the occurrence of seclusion and restraint and have shown some positive results. And one of their biggest challenges, which is true across all of our facilities, is the recruitment and retention of registered nurses and psychiatric technicians. Uh, that continues to be a top priority um, and continues to be a huge uh, issue across the state, not just for our hospitals, but all hospitals uh, in Tennessee and our community providers. Uh, the beautiful Western Mental Health Institute, which is located in Bolivar, Tennessee. In case you don't know where Bolivar is, it is just outside of Jackson. Um, it is a 155 bed facility. Uh, and some of the things that they have going on right now are um, also related to reducing the occurrence of seclusion and restraint. Um, they are almost uh, a, a ligature free uh, facility um, based on their last joint commission survey uh, they uh, found the joint commission found that the toilets at western could potentially um, provide a ligature risk so we have replaced all the toilets there um, and that facility should be ligature free although joint commission will tell us for sure when they come back uh, next year. Um, of course, recruitment and retention of nurses, psych tech, psychiatrists, and advanced practice registered nurses continue be a, to be a top priority there. Um, and telehealth continues to be the primary method of conducting admission evaluations there at that facility with 69% of all admission evaluations being conducted via telehealth. Um, of course, I can't tell you enough how using telehealth actually benefits law enforcement, it benefits the patient, and it be benefits our admissions unit. Um, not only does that individual not have to be transported um, unnecessarily if, if their admission evaluation results in a non-admission decision, but uh, law enforcement, if they are admitted by telehealth, does not have to remain on site for the required one hour and 45 minutes. So law enforcement really loves it. Um, at beautiful Moxon Bend Mental Health Institute in Chattanooga, um, they have several things they're working on there as well. They were just recently uh, visited by a joint commission and are working to correct um, 
anything that Joint Commission found uh, during their visit. Um, they're currently working on a violence reduction by uh, creating a committee that, um, and one of the things that they found in that committee is that um, a lot of aggression was occurring due to hunger. Um, so they have revised their SNAP program uh, in order to reduce aggressive outbursts and initial outcomes prove promising. Um, they're also conducting what they call stay interviews with staff to help improve retention. A stay interview basically is talking to the staff and asking staff what makes you stay or what do you need to make you stay. And they have found that those stay interviews um, have been extremely beneficial in identifying ways to retain um, our staff. Um, they have also, uh, as a result of using Waystar, which is a clearinghouse platform, uh, it's a claims clearinghouse platform, have really been able to increase revenue collections during fiscal year 21 and have just done an awesome job um, of making up for some claims that were never accepted because uh, we didn't have a clearinghouse to tell us clearly where the errors were. So that's been awesome. And last but not least at Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute here in Nashville, which is 207 bed facility. Um, they too had an unannounced joint commission survey this year um, and did extremely well. Um, they've already completed their corrective action for any findings that joint commission may have found there. And um, one of their biggest challenges is just trying to make sure the front door stays open. Uh, as many of you know, they both at Middle and Moccasin Bend, they experience a huge volume of referrals um, for individuals needing uh, psychiatric inpatient care. Of course, uh, our primary goal is to make sure uninsured individuals have access to emergency psychiatric services. Uh, and that is uh, primarily who we serve in our RMHIs, although on occasion we do um, also serve 10 care covered or Medicare covered individuals uh, when another uh, psychiatric inpatient bed cannot be located. Uh, they've just done a phenomenal job of trying to streamline their admissions throughput processes there at middle uh, and uh, keeping the discharges moving along. Uh, in order to make sure there's always a bed available uh, despite the high volume of referrals that we're experiencing. Um, there too, recruitment and retention of frontline staff continues to be a challenge. And of course, we are beginning to see the uh, impact of the uh, COVID uh, Delta variant surge, and um, which has a huge impact on your staff. Uh, so when you're already dealing with uh, some short staff having others that end up getting sick from COVID or having to be quarantined can just really complicate things. Um, and they there at Middle are currently assembling a workplace violence prevention team, um, also aimed at trying to reduce aggressive outbursts. Um, so we're very pleased with the work that's going on at our facilities and happy to provide this update to you today. Any questions that I can help answer? Thank you, Melissa. Uh, let me let me say to all of the presenter, presenters to thank you uh, for the wealth of information and and remember uh, about the chat box and the ability to email uh, Kerry with any questions or comments you may have, or additional information you may need from any presenter today. Uh, it is now about twelve oh seven on my clock, so. If we don't have any other questions uh, that's not been put in the chat box, do you have anything that you need to say, uh, Kirby or Avis? I don't. Just um, thank you, everyone, for, for presenting today. Lots of good information out there. Um, unless, Avis, if you have anything else, we can uh, go ahead and motion to adjourn. No, I don't have anything else other than to echo that as well to thank everyone for attending. We had a great uh, attendance this time uh, as always. And thanks for uh, you, Albert, your first meeting sharing uh, excellent job. Appreciate you as well as Ricky and all the presenters. Thanks everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. Okay, Kirk. Bye.
Hey, Albert, Ricky, thank you so much for y'all's leadership, all the uh, chairs and vice chairs, and members of the regional councils and the statewide council. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, I think I was unmuted there for a second. That was my daughter. She has a baby doll. We're not throwing babies away at my house. That was a baby doll that we had thrown <laughs> away, and now she has a new baby doll. So I just want to set the record straight on that. Not actual children throwing away. That's right. That's right. Um, but uh, thank you so much for y'all's participation today. All right. Thank you, guys, and thank you for all your work behind the scenes. Uh, I will take a motion to adjourn. Wayne King, motion to adjourn. Need a second. Richard. Robert. Richard's got it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Aye. Aye. Until the next time we meet. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye, y'all. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.